Joining us now on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline is ESPN's Trevor Maddich, college football analyst and insider, BYU National Champion. Trevor, nice to have you on the program once again. Great to join you guys. Believe it or not, BYU to the Big 12 rumors have started again. So with that said, the Big 12 is going to vote on whether or not they can play a championship game without divisions on January 15th. Do you think that that legislation will pass and they'll, they'll be able to have a championship game without getting to 12 teams? I don't think it will pass because I think the other conferences don't want the Big 12 to have its cake and eat it too. Other conferences expand it and have their title game, but they also have the headaches of all the extra teams in there and then all the scheduling issues and things like that. When Texas A&M and Missouri left the Big 12 and went to the SEC, the broadcast partners, for the most part, didn't penalize the Big 10 or Big 12 financially for losing those markets, and so they're dividing their money amongst 10 teams. If they add a championship game, they'll get the extra money from the championship game, and they won't have to expand to possibly dilute some of that money. So I think that the other conferences don't want the Big 12 to have that kind of a double advantage. So if it doesn't pass and they're forced to uh, potentially expand. Do you see BYU being invited to the Big 12 in that situation? I think it's possible. The thing about BYU to the Big 12 that makes sense for the Big 12 is that it expands their national uh, you know, footprint without expanding their geographical footprint. BYU is a true national program. And in the Big 12 right now, you've got Texas, Oklahoma, Baylor, and TCU are on the way. And then if they add BYU, that's another national brand. The, the rest of the Big 12 is uh, you know, not, not as much of a national brand as BYU is right now. So they'll get eyeballs on televisions from coast to coast for BYU games, the conference games, that they wouldn't necessarily get for other potential expansion candidates. So that is a, a, an interesting thing there. Also, I don't know, people have talked about getting Central Florida and, and teams like that, which would get a recruiting foothold in the state of Florida, but it also becomes a wildly um, scattered geographic situation for the conference. They've already got West Virginia way out there uh, on the far east of the United States of America just about. So I think that BYU makes a lot of sense. Now, whether or not they go with BYU, I don't know. But I think for the Big 12, there's a, there's a lot of reasons beyond just the, the market, the television market that BYU's in, to bring BYU in that would enhance their, their conference. In your opinion, why wouldn't the Big 12 invite BYU? I think if they wouldn't invite BYU, there'd be a couple of reasons. One is uh, they may want to get bridges to that West Virginia campus. In other words, they might want to bring in Cincinnati, which is also a good recruiting hotbed of the state of Ohio. Uh, and they may add a team like Memphis as well to give two teams that would be more of a natural rival in conference for uh, West Virginia. And it would also be two shorter trips for the Olympic sports. Instead of West Virginia having to send the wrestling team all way out to you know, Lubbock, Texas, they get a couple of shorter trips in there. And so that, that's one of the reasons why you may see the Big 12 look to the east instead of to BYU. Follow him at T. Maddich on the Twitter machine. Trevor Maddich with us on BYU Sports Nation. The football program here at Brigham Young University in a state of transition with Kalani Satake taking over. Ty Detmer is the offensive coordinator. So some real excitement happening. But before we move to 2016 with that new look BYU team, where do you see BYU right now as a program coming off of the 2015 season? I think BYU has earned a lot of respect this year. I mean, the, the, the way the season started with those four tough teams and the way that they, they, they played, I mean, they, they were 2-2 two and two over the course of that. They lost a tight one at UCLA, and then they were just sort of out of gas when they went to play Michigan. But it turns out Michigan is, is fantastic this year. But I think the way BYU started the season earned respect from a national audience. And then I think as the season wore on, BYU maintained that respect. And I think that's a, that's a good thing for them going forward because when you look at the bowl game, even though they lost to Utah, the fact that they fell behind 35 to nothing in the first quarter and it didn't tank, they fought back and, and had a chance to tie that thing up. That, 
I think, built a lot of respect in the national media and from the national fans, football fans in general, not just BYU fans. So I think there's there's excitement for what Tanner Mangum brings to the table. Uh, and I think they don't even realize Mangum's going to have to keep getting better because there are other quarterbacks around there. I mean, Bo Hodge is a guy that can play football. There, there, there are people out there that uh, are, are in position to compete for starting jobs and that the cupboard is not bare. And I think people know that as well. And because of all that, I think BYU this year will enter the season with, with a lot of eyeballs on them, wondering what they'll be able to do next and expecting them to do well. Trevor, where should BYU's focus be as they prepare for the 2016 season, which essentially begins uh, today, first day of class on campus, guys like Troy Warner, uh, you know, enrolled and getting ready, handsome, Taniello. Where should BYU's focus be in 2016? Well, ultimately, they need to run the ball again. And they, they just couldn't because of, you know, the, the situation at running back where starters gone and, you know, they didn't really have the mix of running backs that they needed. And the offensive line didn't, didn't blow open holes like they needed to. Ultimately, the passing attack, as good as it was, was relying on a quarterback who had just an all-timer of a knack of throwing the ball into a, a tight spot and receivers who were big powerful, tall guys with strong hands that were able to win individual matchups. So some of those guys, a lot of those guys are gone now in terms of the receivers especially. And so the the BYU offense will have to get back to running the ball successfully. And how they do that remains to be seen. I mean, Ty Detmer is an offensive coordinator. Uh, we'll see what he does because uh, he'll bring in a lot of knowledge from the NFL about how best to complement a pro-style passing game with the running attack. And so from a scheme standpoint, we may see him slow down a little bit in terms of, in terms of the, uh, uh, the tempo of the offense. May not. I don't know. But either way, whatever they do, the running game has got to be the first priority. Trevor, you of all people who won a national championship here at BYU understand that expectations are sky high for BYU any and every football season. They will peak this year because a guy like Ty Detmer is returning to Provo. What would you say to fans that – really think that BYU should win every game on the schedule next year? Well, I think that. That's good. That's what fans are for. That's their job. You know, and if, they, if, the, if BYU played the Pittsburgh Steelers in September, the fans should expect BYU to win that game. But what you also need to understand is that, that football has remained the same, even though society has moved on in different directions. One of those places is, is just the nature of the hardcore building of a young man in football. And sometimes when you pull back the curtain and you see what looks like a guy being mistreated a little bit, he's actually not. He's being pushed by a coach who loves him, who knows that he's got more in him, and the player himself doesn't know that. And so the coach is getting him to, to be better, and the player will ultimately love him for it. But that doesn't always look good when you pull back the curtain, and we've seen that happen a few times with coaches kind of being hard on some players in, in this season. And another thing is that it takes time. I mean, we are in a, a society now where, where everything is defined by a 140-character tweet, and it means the world. I mean, the world, what somebody says to you in a, in a tweet, but then an hour from now, that tweet is old news. And this is sort of the cycle. It's like the life cycle of a lifespan of a gnat. You know, it just, just it, no <laughs> attention span. Football requires um, delayed gratification. And so as society moves on to less and less attention span and more and more instant gratification, football to be successful remains what it's always been, which is delayed gratification and, and tough people making other people tougher than they thought they could be. And that takes time. It all takes time. So I think what fans need to understand is that even though there's so much excitement with the new staff and some of the new commits in terms of recruiting and all that stuff, this is still a long-term process, and it takes time to get to where they need to go. So as much as fans want to win them all every time, every year, uh, as long as the trajectory is going in the right direction, then fans should give the coaching staff time to build that. Oh, yeah, 5K is way more desirable than a marathon, that's for sure. When you look at the bowl season, a lot of blowouts. What have you thought of this bowl season, Trevor? Yeah, the blowouts have been amazing. I mean, really amazing. <laughs> and I tell you this, I'm disappointed in Oklahoma. You know, I mean, they, they faced a Clemson team that may end up being the best team in the country. Certainly they're ranked number one. But in the second half, Clemson took their will. It looked to me like Oklahoma was completely discouraged and dispirited. And, and, and I don't think they quit, but I think they lost the will 
to fight like they needed to fight. And that, that was sort of a recurring theme. Then you look at TCU against Oklahoma, or excuse me, against Oregon, though. Then Oregon goes ahead, what was it, 38-3 to three or something, just this huge halftime lead. And TCU comes back with a backup quarterback and wins that game. The opposite thing happened. Instead of the Horn Frogs losing their will to fight, they redoubled their will to fight and ended up executing one of the great comebacks in bowl history. Certainly, I think it's the biggest one in terms of points. And so it's interesting when you know people say that some teams just don't want to be where they are. Or they lose. You know, they wish they were in a different bowl or. To me, that makes no sense at all. If you're a competitor, you're a competitor. And it shows up in a bowl game. In TCU, they could have tanked it, played out the last 30 minutes, and gone home. Instead, they fought. Oklahoma, I don't think fought nearly as hard as TCU did in the second half of their game against Clemson. So, you know, it's always interesting to watch how individuals respond to the situation that they're in. So with this blowout theme kind of overshadowing the current bowl season, what kind of a game do you expect in the national championship? between Alabama and Clemson? I think it'll be uh, the first two and a half quarters will be similar to Alabama and um, Michigan State. I think Clemson's defensive front, like Michigan State's defensive front, is good enough to slow down Derrick Henry, the Alabama running back, for two and a half quarters or so. But after that, they're going to need help from their offense to put points on the board so that Alabama is going to have to throw rather than want to choose to throw. And that's one thing that Michigan State's offense was not able to do. And at that point, about two and a half quarters in, Alabama just 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 started to steamroll. And when I look at these two teams, I see a Clemson team on defense that's very similar to Alabama in a lot of ways. But I think Alabama's depth is greater. Alabama has more guys on defense, especially in the front seven, that they can rotate in, that can make plays uh, than Clemson does. And so I think if this thing just becomes an old-fashioned slugfest, in the end, Alabama will come out on top because of their depth. But the thing about Clemson is that they're so aggressive at the line of scrimmage on defense that I think they'll be able to slow down what Derrick Henry's doing, and I think they cover better than Michigan State did. So I think they'll have a better chance of slowing down or or not allowing so many big passes down the field. So this, I think, could be a very close game into the third quarter. And then after that, it will all depend on Clemson's offense. Are they able to move the ball and put some points up? Because if they are, then it will go down to the wire. If they're not, then I think it will break open in Alabama's favor, just like it did against Michigan State. Trevor, our expectations on this show for you will always remain sky high, if you're okay with that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm fine with it. Just uh, catch me if I fall. <laughs> you got it. Thanks for the time, Trevor. All right. Thanks, guys.